think we can make a start. Welcome to our final session for day one of our conference online. I hope that uh, you found many things helpful today and that if something's challenged you, you're not going to just push it aside. You're going to dig in and, and see what that's about and uh, figure out what you think and what God might be saying to you. For our final session today, it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you Mark Griffiths. He has been following Jesus for a number of years and his following of Jesus has seen him uh, take on uh, many different roles. He's used his skills as a community evangelist and as a senior minister and as a kids and families pastor and, and now he's the Dean of Discipleship for St Padron's Institute in Wales. And Mark is one of those fabulous people who uh, to know because he brings his head, his heart and his hands to anything he does and I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of this session. My very great pleasure to hand the microphone to Mark Griffiths. Thanks, Mark. And good morning, everybody. Lovely to uh, be able to talk to you um, this morning. I'm emphasising the word morning because it's very early uh, here in the UK. Um, just to uh, mention in relation to that, uh, this is going to be a great seminar, um, but if, it, if I wasn't half asleep, then this would likely be a spectacular seminar. Um, but I, I will do my uh, utmost with, with what I've got. Uh, Louise has just given some basic introduction to, to who I am, uh, maybe a, a, a little bit more. I uh, married to Rianne, my long-suffering wife. Uh, I've been that little total of things I, I've done uh, in ministry. I've been in uh, full-time Christian ministry for 30 years, or just over 30 years uh, now. Uh, that means somebody's actually been willing to pay me uh, to do the thing that I love doing uh, for three decades, and it has been a real privilege to be able to do that. I have three children. Uh, Nia is 22. Uh, she's uh, just finished university and about to start as a primary school teacher uh, come September. Who knows what that's going to look like with, with lockdown in force and all the rest of it, uh, but we're really rather excited uh, about that. Uh, she uh, spent a little bit of time across the world. She spent a, a year in Australia uh, at Ed's Church in Adelaide, uh, working with a chap called Andrew Shepherd, uh, which she thoroughly enjoyed and has been quite formative for her. Uh, my uh, middle son, Owen, national relations. Um, as soon as that's all signed off, which is likely to be in a month or so, uh, he'll be flying out to New Zealand, uh, where he's going to work uh, across there with New Wine and do a little bit in local politics. And our youngest, Elliot, had his 18th birthday a couple of days ago. Um, you can't see uh, the scenery around my kitchen, but there are uh, big balloons saying happy birthday and the likes here uh, as well. He's about to go to Winchester University, uh, where he's going to be studying politics and international relations. So that's a, a, a little bit about me. I, I uh, have lectured, uh, I've written books, uh, I, I get to do lots of very interesting things. I'm presently training ministers for the church in Wales. So after uh, 30 years in the Church of England, I've moved back into Wales where I'm getting to train ministers, which is an, an absolute blast. And we're enjoying seeing what God is doing. So down to it, the subject, understanding the importance of all ages in the faith community and the impact and influence that has. Now, it's probably worth saying up front, but I'm not going to answer this question in the next 40 minutes. It, it is a giant question. And I hope the fact that I've admitted that I'm not going to answer uh, means that I haven't just lost 40 people from this Zoom call. Uh, but, but all I can do is add my voice to an ongoing conversation. And I would love to stay in that conversation with 
for longer because this is an incredibly important question. It's becoming a vital area of focus for us, for us uh, across the world. Um, and I, I need you to hear the word becoming. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, this is becoming an important area of interest for us uh, across the world uh, right right now. And I'm going to I'm going to hit it relatively aggressively. Um, aggressively, of course, couched with gentleness uh, and grace and, and all the stuff related to that. But I do want to, to, to hit it uh, quite hard. Um, we find ourselves in a precarious position right now. Um, we need to do something. Um, if you see the, the chart on my screen right now, that's uh, the under 18s attending church services in the UK um, right now. Now, now that figure, um, the, the, the whole circle represents 14 million uh, under 18s that live in the UK right now. And as you can see, the number who actually attend church on a Sunday is just 5% of that 18 million. So we're not doing uh, incredibly well. Um, and of course, uh, added to that, we lose an, a, a huge number in that transition period, uh, in moving uh, from uh, in here, primary school to secondary school, uh, usually around about age 12, uh, we lose a large number of people. Uh, David Goodwin uh, has done some wonderful work on this in his book, Lost in Transition. Um, so, we, so we lose even more at that point. Uh, UK research into that says we lose them age 12, but they make their decisions to go uh, aged eight or nine. So they just outwork in that decision uh, when they're able to, um, when they're 12 years of age. So, so we find ourselves in, in quite a, a serious predicament. Um, we find our, ourselves um, fighting against the current, really. Now, I need to be true to the, the statistics. I, I, I pride myself on, on being a good researcher. So I, I need to be fair to what I've just placed in front of you. Uh, these are Sunday statistics. And for some reason, which I can't quite grasp, the majority of denominations are only prepared to look at Sunday attendance. Uh, and they base their, their, their figures across the year based on how many people pitch up on Sunday morning uh, and sit on nice comfortable chairs or, or nasty wooden pews. Um, and that's where they take their, their basis from. And I don't know what that's about. Um, the idea that what we do and the value given to what we do is based on how many people pitch up and sit on pews on Sunday morning is quite erroneous to me. Uh, I have a, an, an absolute belief that God called us to the transformation of all human life under God. The goal wasn't to get them to sit on uncomfortable seats uh, on Sunday morning. And of course, we send a particular message when we measure that. So we say to pastors, the only thing that's important is what happens on Sunday morning, because that's the only thing that we're actually uh, measuring. And I, I'm interested because what if we turn that on its head? What if we began to measure other things? Would we begin to, to instill a sense of this is important as well? Uh, because what we measure is what we value and we show we value it by measuring it. So what if we began to ask the question, how many people go to mainly music? How many people pitch up to, to messy church? What if we had changed the question uh, a little bit? Now, all that to one side, however I mix it, Right now, uh, across many countries, the number of people who will identify as Christian is relatively uh, low. And I, I think we struggle sometimes to, to deal with that um, because we have a difficulty with perception. Now, let me explain that to you this way. If I were to place um, uh, red glasses on with red lenses instead of uh, the glasses that I'm wearing right now, um, then everything will get suddenly rosier and everything would look kind of bright and pink. Um, and if I put some uh, blue spectacles on right now, then lots of you would look ill. Um, now, I'm not talking about the spectacles that we place over our eyes. I'm talking about the spectacles that we place 
over our minds, uh, our uh, conceptions, often our misconceptions. And I, I have a, a feeling that we are not quite prepared uh, to see things clearly. Um, I hit this all the time. That book of common prayer service uh, that happens in lots of our churches on Sunday evening um, across the UK, where only the choir actually turn up. Um, but if you're part of the choir and you like singing on Sunday evenings, you'll fight for that service despite the fact that nobody comes. And you'll deliberately place rose-coloured spectacles over your eyes and try and convince people that this is the most important thing. We all construct theological stories. And we construct theological stories um, to, to try and... Uh, theological stories to protect the things we like. Sorry, I was thrown by the words that just appeared up on my screen. Um, and these theological stories that are protecting the things we like um, are the reasons that coincidentally that hymn or that song which you like the best um, are the ones that you'll maintain are the most anointed. Um, so we, we attribute anointed to the thing that we like uh, the best. And it's incredibly difficult to be able to take those preconceptions off our minds and ask the question, what's actually going on here? What are we really supposed to be dealing with right now? And very few people ask that question. In most churches, it's business as usual, despite the fact that there's not many people in those churches. And for many denominations, they teach in their seminaries no other way of doing it. This is how we do it, despite the fact um, that across much of the world right now, it's not working that well. Um, and that's why uh, I'm led to this statement that I picked up on Tammy Tolman's um, blog recently. And I find it incredibly provocative. And I think I find it incredibly provocative um, because it's true. The church is calibrated uh, for, a, for a world that simply doesn't exist. Incredibly interesting statement. Um, what I want to do is try and address this particular area um, by means of telling you four different stories. Now, the joy of uh, sitting in my kitchen and delivering this particular talk it is... It means when I say to you, is it okay if I go ahead and, and deliver these four stories? There's no congregation in front of me to shout, no, we'd like to do something else. Um, so I, I, I get almost instant permission. So four stories. Um, and what I want to do is use those four stories to hang on various themes in relation to what we're discussing this morning uh, or this evening or wherever you may be. Um, the first story is a story uh, that I've used on numerous occasions. Um, and this is the story of Lieutenant John Blanchard, uh, one of my favorite stories to tell. Um, John Blanchard is a United States uh, Lieutenant. He's in the Navy. Um, and he's a little bit unusual as far as Naval officers are concerned. Um, because when John Blanchard gets uh, time off, um, instead of going out and partying with his friends, um, John Blanchard likes to do something really wild. Um, he likes to wander off and find the closest library to wherever he's posted at that moment. Um, and when he goes to the library, um, he outworks the only form of rebellion that he has in his entire life. His mother always told him, John, you can't choose a book by its cover. And so what John does is he wanders out and deliberately goes to the library to choose books based on their covers. Wild day. Eh? On this particular day, uh, he's turned up at the library. He's looked at the shelves and he's found uh, a book wrapped in blue cloth. He takes it off the shelf. Um, it's been donated to the library and he begins to read it. Uh, it doesn't take him long to recognise that he is reading the most tedious text ever. And yet again, his mother is quite correct. You can't choose a book by its cover. 
But he soon discovers that he's more interested in the annotation on the margins than he is in the text itself. Um, and as he wanders his way uh, down uh, through the annotation, uh, he, he's interested, he reads, he keeps reading. Um, and when he gets to the end, he discovers that the person who donated the book to the library has left her name and address. Hollis Maynell lives in New York City. So he takes a chance. He writes to Hollis Maynell to his absolute amazement, Hollis Maynell writes back. And so letters move back and forth be, between wherever he's posted in, in New York City. Um, and at the end of, of uh, every letter, um, he writes these words. P.S. Um, Hollis, could you please send me a photo? And at the end of every one of her letters, he writes, uh, John, no. Now that's a little bit worrying for him, but the letters continue. He's drafted overseas. Still the letters uh, move back and forth. Eventually he comes back to the United States and he decides that it's time to meet. He writes to her and they agree. They're going to meet in Grand Central Station, New York City. He is going to wear his best dress uniform. And he managed to persuade the library to sell him that book. So he's going to carry the book wrapped in blue cloth with him. She, because this is a traditional tale, um, is going to wear a rose on her lapel. And so um, he arrives. The clock strikes 3 p.m. People are beginning to leave the train that has just uh, pulled in. He stands underneath the clock tower in his best dress uniform, waiting for people to arrive. Um, as the crowd begin to move towards him, I'll, I'll tell you what happens next um, in his words. He says this, as I gazed, a lady starts walking towards me. Her figure is long and slim. Her blonde hair lays back in delicate curls from her delicate ears. Her eyes are as blue as flowers. Her lips and chin have a gentle faint firmness. And in her pale green suit, she looked like springtime come alive. This is one of my favorite stories. That's one of my favorite lines. In her pale green suit, she looked like springtime come alive. And when I was across in Australia a little while back, I asked at a particular conference, um, I said to all the ladies present, uh, if uh, a man said to you, you look like springtime come alive, um, would you marry that man? Uh, and 99% of the crowd uh, placed up their hands um, and all the single men present wrote down the line. <laughs> Well, this is what happens next. John moves towards her, entirely forgetting to notice that this lady is not wearing a rose. And as he gets closer, a small provocative smile curves her lips and she whispers, go in my way, sailor. Almost uncontrollably, John makes one more step close to her and then he sees Hollis Maynell. She's standing almost directly behind the girl. She's a woman well past 50, which is perfectly okay, by the way. She has grey in hair tucked under a hat. She's more than plump and in her thick ankle feet, uh, sorry, her thick ankle feet uh, are thrust into low heeled shoes. The girl in the pale green suit is walking away. And John says, I, I thought I was going to split in two. So keen was my desire to follow her. And yet so deep was my longing for the woman whose spirit had truly companioned me and upheld my own. And there she stood. Her pale, plump face is gentle and sensible. Her grey eyes have a warm and kindly twinkle. And but he writes, I didn't hesitate. These are the good old days. I did not hesitate. I squared my shoulders and saluted. That's what you have to do. I'm Lieutenant John Blanchard. I am so glad to meet you. May I take you to dinner? The woman's face broadens into a tolerant smile. She says, I don't know what this is about, son. 
But that young lady in the green suit who just went by, she begged me to wear this rose on my coat. And she said, if you ask me to dinner, I should tell you that she is waiting in the big restaurant across the street. She said it was some kind of test. It's one of my favourite stories, um, but it, it, it's got a very simple meaning. Hollis Maynell wants to spend the rest of her life with a person who's not interested in how she looks. She wants to spend the rest of her life with a person who's interested in her heart. In biblical terms, the heart is the core of who we are, what we're actually like, what we're like before God. And so God is interested in hearts, not in how we appear, not in how things appear. God is interested in in hearts. This whole thing has to be heart motivated. We need more people who are talking about this. We need more people who are interested in this. We need more people who begin to recognize this is the solution to a whole range of things, but we need them to talk about it from an attitude of this is about the heart. The love of God compels us. That's what the Apostle Paul said. That's such an incredibly important statement because any other motivation is not going to do it. The love of God compels us. And my contention is this. If we begin to understand the why, then we work out how. And the why is related to that, that pie chart I showed you earlier. 5% of our 80 million uh, people under 18 in the UK and across the world right now are not part of Christian communities. We need heart-shaped communities that will meet the need. And so this session is about why. Why do we need to do this? Not about how. Hopefully there'll be lots of sessions which will cover uh, how as this conference continues. But I want to emphasize the heart. Um, I came to Christ when I was 15 years of age. My wife uh, grew up in a, a nominally Christian Welsh Baptist home. So we were, in essence, first-generation followers of Jesus. And we had to try and work out what this whole thing was about. Um, and it, it couldn't be just about a gathering together for an hour on Sunday morning in a dusty, cold building and then a, a venturing back out. It had to be more to it. And also it couldn't be about, this is my ticket to get into heaven one day at some point in the future. It, it, that's just a perk. It's about becoming everything God created us to be. It's about the Holy Spirit shaping and forming and sculpting us so we live well. It's about us learning how to, to deal with hurt and pain and disappointment before God sometimes. And it's about instilling in our children an understanding that they're loved, they're valued, and they're accepted, even if they walk away and become prodigals. And, and mixed into all that, it's those values, heart values, that are supposed to shape our Christian communities. Christian communities which, which are built on those things, not, not, not a formula, but on a heart. We have to communicate that we accept people despite their imperfections and that they're, they're worth loving Acceptance is such a massive word. What do your face say when that less than desirable person walks into your community activity? You see, these are heart responses. I wish you were tidier, more Christian, less smelly. But your face is supposed to say, I'm glad to see you. You are the apple of my eye. That's how God deals with us, by the way. Song of Songs says, with one glance of our eye, we capture his heart. Just by pitching up, we capture God's heart. And it's about heart values. I don't know if you would have picked up, but I, I'm from a, a Welsh mining valley. Um, I, I grew up just as they were closing all the mines. And um, I, uh, I've been away for a long, long time. And I, I had a, a bit of a rough year about five years ago. Uh, and, and what did I do in the midst of that rough year? I, I went back to my Welsh mining valley. I went home. 
Um, I wonder if your prodigals feel the same way. Uh, I wonder if, if they feel that in their time of trouble and difficulty, they can come back to their Christian community because that feels like coming home. And I'm accepted there, not because of what I've done. Um, I, I have reverend before my name. I, I have a, a PhD. You know, they couldn't care less. I'm accepted not because of what I've done. Uh, I'm accepted because of, of who I am. But that's the closest thing I'm going to fly through some points. It's the closest thing I'm going to come to identifying key characteristics of intergenerational communities. My, my big headline is they are heart-driven communities. But that's all I, I, I want to do in terms of that. Um, I, I don't want to drill into the detail of how. I want to keep talking about how, uh, about why. Uh, I think that we're a, a long way away from trying to identify the characteristics of such communities and, uh, and trying to shape it that way. I don't think we've grasped why. Um, and until we, we nail down why um, that we need communities that are heart-shaped, uh, our conversations will be just that, just words. Uh, but if we can nail down the, the, the why, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to, why do we want to build intergenerational heart-shaped communities? And then we can begin to do something significant. Um, story number two. Now remember, we've only got four of them, so don't panic. Story number two. Small church, Scotland, uh, the 1800s. The elders of the church have gathered a special meeting. The subject under consideration is the future of their minister. Um, everybody in the community is invited. Everybody except the minister, uh, because, of course, they want to talk about him. Um, and they, they bounce some comments back and forth. They're trying to work out, do they keep him or do they employ a, a new minister? And they back this back and forth uh, a, a little bit. And, and then the defences and the attacks begin. Um, somebody says he's really old and he hasn't done anything for a long time. And those who want to support him say, yes, he has. Um, he ran a brand new Sunday school this year. Those on the other side say, but how many came? Well, they have to admit only one little boy came. They say, are we really going to employ a minister for the sake of a Sunday school with one little boy? Well, his defenders try their best, but they're losing quickly and very quickly. They are turned around as well. And the whole thing is put to a vote. Uh, and they vote in the end unanimously that they are going to ask their minister to leave and then go to employ a younger minister because the only thing of significance he did this year was lead one little boy to Jesus. Of course, um, the little boy grows up. Uh, his name is Robert Moffat. Uh, we know him as the father of modern missions. He stands in a university in the south of England, uh, and he says, I, I ha have been to Africa, and I saw the smoke of a thousand villages that have never heard the gospel. Who will go? And a young man called David Livingstone stands up and he says, I will go. And we have a, a, an extraordinary missionary uh, to Africa. Um, let me just show you how extraordinary this whole thing is. At the start of the 20th century, one in every 13,000 Africans were followers of Jesus. Today they forecast uh, that shortly there will be 600 million followers of Jesus uh, in Africa. They estimate by 2025, half of Africa will be Christian. Um, and my, my favourite statistic, which I, I love so passionately, is this. Uh, the average Anglican uh, today, the average Anglican um, is 19 years of age. Uh, she is female, she's black, and she's African. And I love that Henry VIII never saw that one come in. Africa owes a lot to a Scottish minister who did nothing of significance that year except lead one nine-year-old child to Christ. And this one proves problematic for most church leaders, this particular area. Our theological colleges and seminaries have bought into a particular a story. It's about the spectacular. It's about chasing after what is termed success. 
and what's successful is what's spectacular. And I'm not at all sure that's a biblical concept. Um, I want to show you uh, how that works and what we teach in our theological colleges and what most church leaders um, have actually bought into. Uh, let's, let's go here. And these, these are the various models of church uh, that we see developing across our world right now. And what our theological colleges teach, um, and I, I'm part of a theological college, um, is uh, you start off with a pastoral church up to 50 people. And after you've done that for long enough, it becomes a, uh, sorry, start off with a family church. So that You move to the pastoral church, which is 50 to 150. You move them from that to a program church. Then you become part uh, of a corporate or or mega church. Um, for the sake of continuity, I, I included that little picture up in that top corner uh, called No Kids, because uh, I, don't, I don't know what it's like where you are. But in the UK right now, we still have a whole range of churches which have typically older people in who, when you really drill down into it, don't want children as part of their congregation. Why? Because they're noisy and disruptive and they don't respect the liturgy and they forget to stand up when the choir enters. And there's nothing we can do about that. We'll wait patiently um, until that particular group of people die off and then we'll plant something into their building. Um, but the other ones are, are models of church which we're seeing developing and it's seen as a progression. Let me show you what it looks like. Um, so the family-sized church and this small church functions like a family with appropriate parental figures. Patriarchs and matriarchs control the church's leadership needs. The pastor, in many ways, is just the chaplain to the small family. And with families in general, a family church, uh, you uh, become part of it. You added to it uh, by being born into it, by marrying into it or being adopted by it. And I, I quite like that last one. Um, this community can adopt you. I like that because when I was 15 years of age and became a follower of Jesus, it was because of one of those little family churches. Um, I, I wandered on in and this group of people adopted me uh, and looked after me and took care of me. It was the wildest, wildest experience and so incredibly formative for me my first experience of Christians, and they were wild, wild people. I was in a building which looked like a shed, and outside it had the words Pentecostal Church. And that, that was it. That was the descriptor. Um, and I walked on in, and uh, it, it was just wonderful and joyful, and everybody owned a tambourine, and every tambourine had ribbons, and every person could, could actually shake their tambourine in formation, um, and I promise you, uh, if this particular building had had chandeliers, these people would have been swinging from them. Um, it, it was a great, great, exuberant, wild place um, to become a follower of Jesus. And they adopted me uh, and they, they looked after me. But in terms of, of ecclesiology, um, this is where most pastors would say they start, it's their first job. And as soon as they've had some experience, they move on to the bigger thing. Um, so let's push to one side quite quickly. We move to our, our pastoral church. Um, the, 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 the pastoral church, 50 to 150 people. Uh, it's got a leadership circle. Uh, the key feature of the pastoral size churches is, is the, the laity's needs uh, are met through their personal relationship with a seminary trained pastor. Uh, in a pastoral size church, it'd be rare for a Bible study or a prayer meeting or a Sunday service to happen without the pastor. Uh, it's proud of its sense of itself as a family in which everyone knows everyone else. And people tend to join or indeed they tend to leave uh, because of the pastor. Um, that's the, the congregational church. And, and, and we're, we're taught that we, we grow into that. And our next stage is the program size church, 150 to 350 people. Um, Well-functioning program size church has many cells of activity, which are headed up by lots of lay leaders uh, these lay leaders, in addition to providing structure and guidance, also take on some pastoral function. Pastors are still the center of the program size church, 
but their role has shifted dramatically and you'll notice it's pastas rather than single pasta uh, and we move to that people tend to be attracted to pastoral size churches not because of the pasta because of the programs the church runs and then we're told to aim for the the corporate church or the mega church the quality of sunday morning worship is the first thing you usually notice in a corporate sized church a lot of work goes into making Sunday worship a rich experience. The head of staff spends most of his time preparing for preaching and leading services. The welcome will be, will be slick, a well-oiled machine. Um, in the, the corporate-sized churches, the head of staff will rarely know the names of all the people. People join the quality. Uh, the people uh, join because of, of the quality of programs and typically the quality of the worship. And there are a large number of employed staff. Um, but the mega church or the large church, certainly in the UK, masks something. Um, the, the corporate church will typically have several hundred teenagers, several hundred uh, children. But if you dig deeper, and I did the research into some of these, these things, um, we'll discover quite quickly uh, that they, yes, they do have a couple of hundred teenagers, but they didn't come from the children's program. Uh, they came in afresh. And if we came back in three years' time, we discover a completely different couple of hundred teenagers and a completely different couple of hundred children because the turnover is so incredibly great. But because the numbers are high, it masks what's actually taking place. Um, but this is our definition of success. Success is the corporate church, the mega church. And what we train people to want to do is push towards um, that thing, to try and become part of the big thing. That's the dream of all pastors. And it's incredibly difficult to shake free of that. And we're programmed to chase after the mega church. And it's very difficult to shake. And in my season as a senior leader, I instinctively knew that church planting was the way forward. So we planted and planted. And very quickly, we arrived at a central church of 300 people, five church plants of 80 people. But the pressure and tension to, to, to be pushed into, if I pull them all together, I've got my corporate church. We've got our mega church. And of course, if you're a church of 80, you're struggling. It's hard work. There's not enough uh, musicians. Uh, the, all the musicians you have seem to, uh, incapable of getting the chords right. Not enough youth workers. Not enough children's workers. Uh, and you see the trap that's associated with that. What we try and do is run our 80 people as if it was a mega church. Um, and we try and build and, and shape and form that but in the church of 80 people, everybody's got to have their sleeves rolled up. Everyone uh, has got to be uh, involved. But the difficulty in recognizing that your 80 people church is a good thing when big church is far more polished and professional. And we don't have to listen to Tim and his accordion leading worship every Sunday. The difficulty in recognizing that we've got a good thing is hard for us because everything around us is pushing us to want to have the mega, to want to have the corporate. And we need to rethink it because I suspect that we're caught in a trap. Um, we chase after the spectacular, constantly chasing after the spectacular. But God didn't call us to chase after the spectacular. He called us to chase after the significant. But it's about showing how impressive I am. But nobody cares how impressive you are. We're followers of a crucified Christ. You're called to make disciples. That's it. Everything else is superfluous. Go and make disciples. But I'd like a big church with my own car parking slot. And everybody will think I'm a success. No, go and make disciples. But I want to be able to employ the best worship leader. No, go and make disciples story three Ireland this time I'm covering the country quite well really I was 19 uh, I was at theological college and approaching half term um, I was definitely a poor and struggling student and rarely had the finances to go home for half term but on, on this particular uh, end of term a few churches in Ireland 
had invited me over to do a series of youth events. Um, now, I, I need to help you with definitions very quickly. Uh, I, I worked it out very quickly. Ireland has always done intergenerational events because if you are breathing, then you can attend a youth event in Ireland. And so if you turn up for a youth conference in Ireland, there will be babes in arms all the way through to very old people with medals and wheelchairs. Irish youth events are really something else. So imagine the scene. It's Saturday night and I've been invited to preach at a youth conference just across the border in a place called Dundalk. And this is in Southern Ireland. It's the largest Pentecostal church, but it's dwarfed by the a, huge uh, Roman Catholic churches across the road uh, with this convent next door to it. And there are, in I, I wonder, and there are 250 people in this church. Um, and this is the Saturday night out in Dundalk. And they're very excited to be there. Children on the front row, paper, colouring pens, chairs removed for various people with mobility issues and everything in between. The minister greets me at the door. He's an American missionary to Ireland, he tells me. Um, he's been sent from the Pentecostal seminary in the States. But I'm soon to discover that he's not the typical radical Pentecostal. The service begins. I'm traveling with this little youth band, and they are pretty good. Uh, the sun worship is, is bordering on contemporary. I'm sat in the front uh, on the platform, uh, facing everybody else. That's the way they do it. Two chairs on the platform, one for me, one for the minister. And the, the music is playing. Uh, I've got my eyes closed and I've got my, my hands raised and I'm swaying back and forth and moving my feet a little. Uh, I'm not sure you would really describe it as dancing. Uh, and then I, I feel a tap on my shoulder. Uh, I open my eyes and there's the minister. And he says these words, brother, this is the house of the Lord, not some nightclub. So take your hands down and stop moving your feet. And that's what he says to me. And with that, he walks away. And I'm cross. I suspect it's not helped by the fact that a few weeks earlier, I'd read Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. Oh, and the fact that I'm 20 years of age at this point and definitely impulsive. Um, it's about to contribute to what happens next. So when it's time to preach, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the fear of God into these people. I'm going to drag them kicking and screaming into what was then the 20th century. I was going to talk about hell and people going to hell and it happening because of their lack of concern. And I went for it. Arms raised, uh, voice raised. Uh, it was going well. They looked thoroughly condemned. And to my slight agitation, the minister seemed to be enjoying it. And the children on the front row just kept colouring. And I kept preaching, um, well, shouting mainly. Um, oh, except for one little three-year-old girl on the front row. Um, she would colour something and then she would stop and she would look up and she would stare at me for a couple of seconds. And then she would drop her head back down uh, and she would continue to colour again. And then it happened. I'm in mid-rant telling them how many people in Dundalk are going to hell because they have no witness when the little girl sits up, faces me, and turns her drawing towards me. She has spent um, the entire evening uh, drawing me. Uh, and she draw me with really long arms, looking like I had more than two. Uh, a stick body, enormous feet, and a bright red head. Obviously, that level of passion uh, takes the blood pressure up. And she looked at it, and then she looked at me, and she gave me the biggest, cheekiest smile. And I looked at her, and at the picture, and at her smile. And in the middle of that serious, condemn, condemnatory piece of eloquence, I smiled. I couldn't help it. And then I laughed. And I stood there looking at her and had the picture in her hands, stood there laughing. And she sat there looking at me and she began to laugh as well. And this went on for a, for a couple of minutes. And the congregation um, looked rather concerned and began to um, start whispering to each other in an uncomfortable sort of way. 
They didn't mind my rant. That they, they got that every week from their minister. Uh, but suddenly it looked like the preacher uh, at the front uh, had completely lost it. I was stood there giggling and they were pretty convinced that it had a breakdown. But I saw it. I saw it in the eyes of a three-year-old girl, one of the most glorious commodities I could ever encounter. And one I wanted to bring with me from that point forward. The glorious commodity is called hope, a complete belief in hope. And I saw it in the eyes of a three-year-old girl. And at that moment, it changed me. And I had to change direction in mid-preach. I started with my apology. This is not the gospel. This is not what Jesus preached. I'm sorry. The gospel is about love and joy and compassion and grace. Um, and they looked very concerned for the first 10 minutes of me changing direction. And then they began to grasp a message, a message of hope, which had the power to transform far more than any message of condemnation. And I became a hopester, um, not a hipster. I'm not quite sure what a hipster really is, uh, but a hopester, captivated by hope. Uh, Cornell West, uh, Princeton Theological College, was asked, are you hopeful about the next decade? And he said these words, the categories of optimism and pessimism do not exist for me. I am a prisoner of hope. And right there, at the very heart of the gospel message is the idea that the light shines in the darkness, the light always shines in the darkness, and the darkness can't co comprehend it or overpower it, overpower it. So we're looking for people with the right heart who will recognize that the significant is much more important than the spectacular and who have become prisoners of hope. So, so get that again. This message this morning is, is this. This is what we're looking for. If, if we can get this right, we'll build what we need to be able to re-engage our world. We're looking for people with the right heart who recognize that, that significant is more important than spectacular and that have become prisoners of hope. And there are plenty of keys about intergenerational um, involvement being one of the biggies, but I don't want to do the keys. I want to lay down the principles. Um, uh, and others will, will do the rest. But let me very quickly, and I, I'm, I'm chasing the clock, I'm sure, uh, return to this. I want to I make the, the observation that in terms of our general population, there are simply not a lot of Christians um, kicking about. We need to own up to it. We need to take the coloured spectacles off. We need to hold up our hands and say, whatever model we've been using for the last 100 years, it's not working right now. And what it actually has done is it's lost us generation after generation. And we have to rethink the very essence of who we are. Uh, this message really is that wild this morning. But this evening. Uh, we have to rethink who we are. Albert Einstein is widely credited with saying this. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results. And we're doing the same things over and over. And we need to rethink that whole thing. And that, that incredibly provocative statement, church isn't calibrated for the world as simply... The, world, the church is carried for a world that simply doesn't exist. So we have to recognize we really are back at the start. And you and I have to begin to ask ourselves, therefore, how do we re-evangelize a nation? What do we need to build in so that we don't make the same mistakes that we did the first time around? How do I work with the Holy Spirit to see a church where young people don't leave when they're 12 years of age? Because it's really rather difficult to walk away from family. How do I work with the Holy Spirit to see a church where people generally become part and don't disappear out of the back door as quickly as they appear in the front door? Where it feels like a family where you are accepted and valued and loved and involved even though you're broken uh, and fragile and imperfect and often feel quite damaged. We're all discipled into a particular way of doing church. But what if you could start again? What if I gave you a blank piece of paper? What if I said you could begin from scratch? What would you develop? Would it look like what we presently have? Did Jesus really break into time and space and die in horrific death for the creation of an institution with his liturgy and its robes and its drafty buildings? 
Is that really what it's all about? And one final story. Um, one of my, my favourite stories. Uh, this uh, book was published in 1922. And I want to read you just an extract uh, from a book called The Velveteen uh, Rabbit. Um, and it, it uh, goes like this. It's a conversation uh, between the rabbit um, and the skin horse. This is what happens. Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long time, not just to play with, but really loves you. Then you become real. Well, does it hurt? Asks the rabbit. Sometimes, says the skin horse, but he was always truthful. But when you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? Mm, it doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily, or have sharp edges, or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, your eyes have dropped out, and you get loose in the joints, and you look very shabby indeed. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who simply don't understand. Um, we have to work this out. Um, you and I have a world to win. Um, but let me say this to you. It's possible by the time we work it out, um, most of our hair would have been loved off and we might feel quite shabby indeed. But we'll be part of something that's real. And the, and the, the search has got to be to be part of something that's real. There's plenty of easier options. We've been doing them for an incredibly long time. But there's a world to win. And so this is where we went. We're looking for people with the right heart who recognize that significant is far more important than spectacular and who have become prisoners of hope. This is not supposed to lead to, to some pessimistic darkness. This is supposed to lead to a pursuit of the light. And all those three points are supposed to be done in the pursuit of trying to find something that's real, trying to, to, to create, working with the Holy Spirit to see what God can do. There's a world to win, and it's time to get real. Brilliant. What an excellent way to uh, end our first day. I'm very grateful for you getting up bright and early for us, Mark. Um, it's been a <laughs> wonderful conference. Wonderful to hear what you had to say. You can join. Was early, Louise. That wasn't bright. <laughs> you can join the conversation on our Facebook page by um, signing up to the website. Uh, there's lots of different webinars, and you can hold a conversation at your church. Um, and yeah, what would it look like to reimagine? What if we started with a blank sheet of paper? What if we took the great things that are now, and uh, and got rid of some of the other? Um, yeah, stories of hope. I'm really grateful for stories of hope. That's what we need. I'm just going to uh, close in prayer for us. Father, I want to thank you uh, that you are light that pushes darkness out and uh, you are the source of all hope. Holy Spirit, would you fill our hearts with hope? Would you uh, empower us to bring hope and Jesus' light to the world? Jesus, we want to see you be found by everyone. Help us to walk in step with what you are doing, God. Help us to understand why it is important that we join you. 